wake up. It's the Sleep Unplugged Podcast, episode 84. Sleep and smartphones. No one's answering. Welcome, everyone, to the Sleep Unplugged Podcast. My name is Chris Winter. I'm a neurologist, sleep specialist, and your host for this episode of the podcast. If you're new to the Sleep Unplugged Podcast, welcome. If you're a veteran of the podcast, welcome back. We're excited that you're here. This is an obvious topic. I'm surprised we're all the way on episode 84 before we're talking about cell phone use. I think it's time to, to jump into it. I, I think one of the hesitancies for doing it was the evidence is just kind of overwhelmingly negative. So I actually was sort of approaching this episode trying to be the devil's advocate. Well, maybe they're not that bad. Maybe there's evidence out there that says, look, we're really blowing this out of proportion. It really doesn't do that much. So I really try to take a critical angle looking at this so that as you're listening to this and you're somebody who's devoted to your phone or you've got children who are devoted to their phones, I'm going to try to come at this from the phone side, like that the phone is okay. So I'm not trying to bash anything. And, and let me tell you that that's hard. It's, it's really not great, but we'll, we're going to have a fun discussion about these anyway, for a lot of different age ages that, that use phones. So if you're interested in communicating with the podcast, you can, you can find me on social media, Instagram, DR Chris Winter, Twitter, TikTok, Blue Sky Threads. We have a YouTube Sleep Unplugged page where we post all the videos of this. And I've got some really exciting, interesting comment coming up, uh, content coming up. If you're somebody who consumes my videos on YouTube, that's great. We're, we're, we're happy you can hear the information any way you want. But you basically get a white wall in my office with this fantastic Roy Lechenstein print of Sleeping Girl and the logo of our Sleep Unplugged podcast, a couch, and me. Um, and I think that some future content that we're going to be recording on location is going to be a lot more exciting. Plus, I want to take this show on the road with Major League Baseball spring training. We'll try to record in some fun, fun places when I uh, start visiting my teams. Uh, just wanted comments, corrections, criticisms. Had a quick correction. Brendan, a uh, friend of the show, said, hey, in your last episode, you kept saying Mata Hopple instead of Mott the Hoople. And I was like, no, I didn't. And I went back and listened to the podcast. And sure enough, I did. I have no idea why I was doing that. But we just kind of casually mentioned that and all the young dudes, somebody had written the show and referenced Mott the, the Hoople. And I, I guess I was just rhyming hopple, mopple. So anyway, I, I mispronounce stuff all the time, I guess, is if you listen to the podcast enough, You've probably heard me mispronounce names and all kinds of good stuff. Rene Descartes, the, the mathematician, I think it's a Descartes, <laughs> whatever. So uh, thank you, Brendan. Uh, really appreciate you looking out. We don't want to disrespect Mott in any way, shape, or form. A couple quick comments from listeners. I had a really nice one from Shauna referencing back to the exploding head syndrome episode. Shauna wrote, thank you. I've been not so patiently waiting for you to cover this. I'm pretty sure I have it, but I didn't know it was a thing until about a year ago. Also heard a lovely international listener Seneva wrote, hey, Chris, I immensely enjoy your podcast. Thanks for being so thorough and scientific in your approach to sleep. I have a topic suggestion. Many medications can cause visit, vivid dreams or nightmares. And I'm current, currently experiencing this myself. Um, and even if the most of the dreams are action-packed and fun, I feel like I'm dreaming all night and a little bit concerned about this. Best wishes from Norway. Well, thank you very much, Suniva. Appreciate that. And just to give you a quick update, my buddy listener, Laura from the Netherlands, who she and I share a last name, we're actively working on trying to figure out a way we can get genetically tested to see if Laura, Sleep Unplugged fan and listener, is in fact related to the Sleep Unplugged host. So that'll be a lot of fun. And like I said, we, we don't just feature the positives. We definitely feature the negatives. Got an interesting 
I would consider to some degree negative uh, viewer response um, recently from Kathleen. Kathleen said, hello, I've listened to two of your podcasts. As a person with a sleep disorder, I found your podcast really disappointing. And frankly, it created a lot of anxiety. I'm not going to mention this person's name who recommended you. You talk way too much about things that don't have to do with your topic. The first half of your podcasts are ridiculous. Fortunately, we have fast forward. I'm not listening to a sleep expert to hear about John Mellencamp. And you actually go on and on about nothing. I find your actual information very informative and will now continue to use fast forward or find another sleep expert. Uh, anyway. People like you like to take up airtime to hear themselves speak, um, Kathleen. Well, thank you, Kathleen. I appreciate you taking the time to write in. I think, yeah, I think that I do tend to speak about things outside of sleep at the beginning of the podcast. I try to keep it relatively short, but it's kind of fun. I don't necessarily like to hear myself speak. In fact, I don't really like to listen to the podcast once they're out there. Um, and I'm sorry you don't like John Mellencamp. Uh, I was thinking, what, what? John Mellencamp reference did I have? And I was thinking, I think with episode 55, Wild Nights, which is a Van Morrison song, I did mention John Mellencamp cover that. So, well, Kathleen, keep hitting that fast forward button or maybe find a better sleep podcast. Maybe Matt Walker's podcast would be more of your cup of tea. So, uh, but appreciate you taking the time to, to write in. Sorry, it's my podcast is causing you anxiety. That's the thing that bothers me most because I really want this podcast to alleviate anxiety by informing you, my listener. So real quick, uh, apologies to Kathleen. And Kathleen's right. We probably need to jump right into the meat a little bit quicker. But listen, if you don't like to hear what we talk about at the top of the show, just you can fast forward till we get to it. But I, I do like to mention a little song lyric at the beginning of every show. You can find all the songs we talked about on the Sleep Unplugged Spotify playlist, volumes one, we're on volume two now. No One's Answering is from the song Telephone Line from one of my favorite bands and one of the producers of the show's favorite bands, ELO, Jeff Lynn. This was off of their new world record album, which was their sixth recording. And I'm a huge fan of, of these, these albums. Fifth one was Face the Music with Evil Woman and Strange Magic. A New World Order had Living Thing, Do Ya, Telephone Line, which we're talking about now. And then Out of the Blue was Turn to Stone, Mr. Blue Sky. Uh, I, I, just a massive ELO fan. ELO is an interesting band. They they never actually had a never, number one hit. I think they're the most successful band to never have a number one hit. This song was off of Telephone Line, which is one of my favorite songs. And one of the things I think that's kind of interesting about Telephone Line is if you listen to the song, the beginning, it's, it's, a, it's a call that's you know, ringing and ringing, nobody's answering the phone. But the, 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 the tone that you're hearing is an American dial tone, even though ELO or a busy signal or a no, dial tone, even though ELO was a British band but they really felt like the key to their success was tapping into the American market. They were much more successful in America. So when they recorded the song, they used an American um, ringtone, which I'd never really thought about that before, but I thought that was kind of cool. So we'll put the ELO song telephone line on the Spotify playlist, but I'm also going to add strange magic, which is such a great song. And I think I can justify putting that song on our playlist because there is a great line, sweet dreams, sweet dreams, got a strange magic. So they're talking about dreams, they're talking about sleep, and it goes on the playlist. So let's get into cell phones and sleep. If you're if you're like Kathleen and you're in a hurry and you don't need all the talk and you don't need to listen to me speak, here's the summary. It's bad. It's it's not good. There's really nothing about phone use in and around bedtime that is good. I think the only thing that we can sort of hang our hat on here is, is it devastating to sleep? No, it, it's not. And I will say this, if you're somebody who is listening to this podcast because you've got terrible insomnia, it takes you four to five hours every night to fall asleep, and you're thinking, well, maybe if I just got rid of my cell phone, that would cure the insomnia problem. It probably won't. 
this is not the order of magnitude that we're talking about here. It's again, we, we've talked about this before in the show. Are we enhancing sleep? Are we improving it or worsening it a little bit in this margin? Or are we making some massive change in terms of somebody's sleep? I think this would be in that sort of marginal category. But when we think about these marginal changes to sleep or marginal worsenings of sleep, we have to think about these things as happening multiplied over a long period of time. And I think that's where the malignancy of cell phone use in and around sleep really comes into play. It is the lack of 10 minutes, lack of 20 minutes of sleep every night for the entire week. So 20 times five, that's a hundred minutes, an hour and 40 minutes of sleep loss per work week if you're a kid using a cell phone in your bed and it's costing you 20 minutes. So that's kind of the best we can do. You know, oh my gosh, I'm worried if my son has his cell phone up in his bedroom, it's going to take him hours and hours and hours to fall asleep. I, I don't think so. That's not what we're really talking about here. But is it affecting the quality of your child's sleep? Absolutely. And it's study after study after study. It was an endless number of studies. And they all said virtually the same thing. So let's get into some of these. So when we talk about cell phone use, I thought it would be interesting to start off with looking at different age groups because I was thinking, well, maybe it's terrible for children, but as you grow up and you can buy alcohol and you can buy firecrackers and you can buy cigarettes, maybe you can use a cell phone and it's not that big of a deal. It was, oh, it's just so weird. Speaking of that, I went to buy, I was buying alcohol for a party that was, that we're sort of putting on and was buying some Prosecco. And when I checked out at the self-checkout line, it, it's, I scanned the thing and, and it popped up on the screen. Is this individual under 40? I was like, what in the world does that mean? I thought, what does 40 have to do with anything? I thought 21 was that. And, and I asked the person, I said, why did I ask if, if I was over or under 40? And she said, she didn't understand my question. And we were, we were having trouble kind of communicating. And But anyway... So as you get older, maybe 40 is the magic number. If you're under 40, cell phones really bother your sleep. But as you get over 40, yeah, no problem. You, you, you can handle it because you're an adult. You're, you're, you're a big person at that point. And when you looked at this study, this was from a, a 2016 study called Bedtime Mobile Phone Use in Sleep in Adults. The numbers were just staggering to me. So again, 2016. We're, we're, you know, eight years ago. So it's, it's, it's a long, 2016 does not seem like eight years ago. So eight years ago, half the respondents in the study owned a smartphone and six out of 10 took it to bed. My guess is that number is higher now. Don't you feel like that's the case? I'm guessing that's a complete, complete speculation. Sending and receiving text messages in her cell phone calls after lights out, significantly presented respond, predicted respondent scores on the PSQI, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. So that's a measure of sleep quality that we've talked about previously in the show. Particularly longer sleep latencies. So if you have your phone with you and you're sending texts and receiving calls in the night and using your phone, it's going to take you longer to fall asleep. Worse sleep efficiency. So you will awaken more during the night, whether you're aware of it or not. So more arousals during the night, which we don't want. When people come to me and say, oh, I just wish I could sleep well. I just had a person write me an email and they said, I'm at my wits end because I wake up a lot during the night. Well, there you go. That's sleep efficiency. More sleep disturbances and more daytime dysfunction. Bedtime mobile use predicted respondents later self-reported rise time. So you got up later, higher insomnia scores and increased fatigue. And what was really interesting was when you looked at cell phone use among older individuals, they tended to wake up earlier than they wanted to. When you looked at cell phone use among young people, they tended to wake up later than they wanted to. So I thought that was really interesting, this idea that cell phone use is hurting people's sleep regardless of the age, but it tends to look differently in different populations you know, adults want to get up at you know seven, they're waking up at 5.30, frustrated with that. You know, 
young people want to get up and get their homework done. Maybe I'll get up at 9, 30, 10. They're waking up at noon kind of thing. So this study clearly shows that there is an impact and it's negative when older individuals use cell phones. Well, what about college students? There's a lot of really interesting research about this. This was a study in 2021 called Smartphone Usage, Sleep Quality, and Depression in University Students. And I'm going to make a, another little caveat here. This episode could be ours. And I really wanted to focus on sleep and, and phone use. If you start looking at anxiety, depression, social connectedness, lonely, uh, th that could be a whole separate topic. And that is some really grim data. And it's particularly grim when you look at the studies that happened in and around COVID and beyond. It just, COVID was a turning point for a lot of different things. And even though we're kind of, don't you, do you ever get to the place where you're on a phone or on a plane and you're flying and you're like, oh my God, it wasn't that long ago that we were all scared to be here. And when we had to fly, we all had ma double mask. I was a double masker, man. I had the... N95 and then the cloth mask over top of that, just, you know, and just the God, having trouble breathing through those. It was just not a comfortable situation. We're not that far away from that. So, you know, the mask might be the thing we all remember about that time, but man, was it a devastating time in terms of psychiatric health, particularly for college age, young, you know, high school, college age students. Well, anyway, 804 students were looked at in this study. The average age was about 21. Total daily phone usage was almost eight hours, 7.85 hours. And when you actually looked at the, the numbers, the relationship was very clear that according to the multivariate linear regression analysis, significant relationships were statistically determined in a positive way between smartphone addiction and PSQI, so the more addicted you were to your phone, the more you used it, the more you were likely to have disturbances in sleep quality, and the more likely you were to have a high uh, BDI, Beck, um, uh, Beck depression inventory score. So among college students, it, it, it really, again, one study after another, there was a, look, there was a study from 2021, smartphone addiction, and sleep quality on academic performance, 323 uh, students. And it showed that the greater the smartphone use and addiction, the poor sleep and poor uh, academic performance. So it was all just kind of this web of you slept more poorly, you did more poorly in school. Uh, and, and it was a very, very sort of uh, direct relationship that more the hours went up on the phone, the more you saw the decline in academic performance. So let's look at the young young kids. And this is where it really kind of gets scary, I think. This was a study uh, from 2015, screen time. Screen time and sleep among school-aged children and adolescents, a systematic literature review. And this was brought to us by our buddy, Lauren Hale. You can follow her at Lauren Hale, PhD. She's up in, I think she's at Stony Brook. Long Island, up in New York. Uh, she's on Twitter. You can follow her. She's got really great. She posts really great stuff and super, super smart. But anyway, she was part of this study that looked at 67 studies published between 99 and 2014. And they found in this sort of literature review that screen time is adversely associated with sleep outcomes in 90% of the study. So this is what I'm talking about is when you're looking around and trying to find studies that don't show a connection between phone use and negative sleep outcomes, good luck. You're going to be looking a very long time. And when you find them, they're usually more indeterminate. It's not like 10% of the studies are showing, no, 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 great outcomes. Let your kid have the phone because in the 10% of the studies that Lauren found, everything was great. No, it was just more, it just didn't show anything. Like they couldn't show that relationship wasn't powered to show it, wasn't designed to show it. So it's just, this is this kind of, this kind of reminds me of climate research. You know, the, the well, we found this rando kind of bizarre professor at some school you've never heard of who's still out there 
writing letters to the editor and publishing things that global warming is not real. It's a misinterpretation of data. This is stuff that happens all the time and we're making way too big of it. I mean, I, I don't really hear much about those people anymore. Remember that? You know, remember that guy that was, you know, testifying that said, you know, or whatever, or the, the one administration found that one expert and they redesigned the entire web page based upon, you know, th that's not happening here. This is an overwhelming abundance of knowledge. I mean, we talk on this pop podcast a lot about my wish that there was a rating of, I'm going to make a statement that's factual, but maybe it's kind of factual or maybe it's not arguable anymore you know that you know or whatever. so I, I think this would be in that not arguable situation now we're we're in that side of the spectrum here this isn't new evidence scant evidence a couple studies have shown that and we have to be careful i mean on my own podcast i worry about that that We've talked about studies before. Here's a study about this white noise machine that improves sleep. Well, it was one study and it was 12 participants. So I, I try to sort of be transparent about these things. That that's and maybe it's real. I'm not saying it's not real. I'm just saying we don't have a lot of evidence behind it. But you know, when you've done multiple trials and people have recreated the same results over and over in different places around the world, you start to really believe it. So I'm sorry to beat that to death, but I just want to really make sure that we're all on the same page here, that this is an overwhelmingly abundant body of scholarship that's talking about phone use really being a negative. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple more. There's two more studies I just want to mention very quickly. The use of social media modifies teenagers' sleep-related behavior. This was a 2018 study. Uh, 786 questionnaires went out, were completed by sixth to ninth graders. And what the study showed was that internet access, this was back in 2018, was almost universal. 98.3% of the individuals in the study had access to an internet. 85% of these students had cell phones. 42% or 43% had personal computers in their bedroom. Social media was used by 64.6% .6 of these students. After dinner, 52.6% spent time at least an hour, and 14% spent more than two hours in front of a screen. After bedtime, 52% of them regularly used, regularly used electronic devices of which 25.6% had a screen-based activity, text, social media, video games, television. I think they're trying to differentiate from that an individual listening to this podcast or some music or the daily or whatever they like to listen to versus a screen with light and, and that content. During the night, some teens woke up to continue screen-based activities. 6% of these teens woke up in order to play online video games. 15% woke up to syntax and 11% to use social media. Sleep deprivation during the week was less common in sixth graders, 5%. So 5% of these students uh, were sleep deprived directly related to their phone versus when you looked at the ninth graders, 15% of them exhibited sleep deprivation, signs of sleep deprivation. Um, difficulties falling asleep were reported in 33% and 9% took well over an hour to fall asleep. So real, and all these were massively statistically significant, you know, taking 9% taking over to uh, over an hour to fall asleep, p-value is less than 0. 0.0001. So not hard to determine. Uh, the, the last study I want to mention really quickly uh, from college students was uh, a 2019 study called Interrupted Sleep, College Students Sleeping with Technology. And there's a sub-entity I think is worth discussing when we talk about sleep and phones in the bed. We have talked about parasomnias before, and while this is not its own parasomnia, I think personally it probably should be, and that's sleep texting. So we've talked about sleep talking, we've talked about sleepwalking and exploding head syndrome and all kinds of good parasomnia. Well, sleep texting is one where you awaken the phone is generally in your bed and you send a text that you either have no idea what the content of the text was or you have no idea that you actually even did it. 
and I think we've talked about before that we had variations of this. When I was in residency, I would get a call when I was, when you're a chief resident, you, you get to the end of your residency, you're kind of like in a leadership position within your department. There's an ortho chief, a neurology chief, a pediatrics chief, a dermatology chief. I, you know, everybody gets, you know, calls in the night, probably some more than others. And when you get a call, you get a call from a junior resident. Hey, Chris, this is, you know, Justin and got a patient down here in the ER, a 73-year-old man, I think, who's had a stroke and da-da-da. And so they give you the little bullet and they tell you what the plan is for the patient and you agree or you modify or you feel like, wow, this is super serious. I'm going to come into the hospital and help you out with that. And there were a lot of times when that phone call would happen and I would either have no recollection of it the next day when I spoke to Justin, or I would sort of become conscious of the conversation halfway through my discussion with Justin. And that is a very disturbing situation. In, bo in both situations are very disturbing. I mean, somebody's having a stroke and you're not entirely sure what you talked about. And I had very frank conversations with residents if that ever happened like I, w what did we talk about i'm not listen I, I take me through what we've just talked about because i'm, I'm kind of waking up here and i'm not exactly remembering what you first told me like you had to be honest didn't you <laughs> you could just be like okay well i hope everything's out but you know it was really really interesting is that you know generally the text made sense you know the conversations made sense so when you talk about sleep texting a quarter of the sample in this 2016 study reported sleep texting behavior that accompanied generally poor sleep. And individuals who took their phone with them to bed had much more likely, were much more likely to engage in these kinds of behaviors. And in this study, 72% of individuals who engaged in it had no recollection of text texting. So the next day, when you encounter that individual, like, what did you mean by this? You don't know anything. What are you talking about? You texted me last night and sent me this kind of disturbing picture and this comment about like, what do you mean by that? And you, you don't remember any of it. 25% remembered communicating. They just don't remember what they communicated about. So, I mean, both of those are just a gateway to terrible things. So if you're a parent with a kid who's got a cell phone in their bed, I mean, listen, you shouldn't have the bed, the phone in your bed to begin with. You don't need to be sending those texts to your friends and colleagues and people who work for you. You definitely don't need those things going from your kid's phone to whoever, because there's, there's always going to be a record of it. You know, I, you can't prove what I did or didn't do when I was in residency talking to Justin about the guy who came in with a stroke. That was a cell phone call. It is Justin's word against my word. That was the, the times that we lived in. We had a pager. There's nothing really stored. Now, anything you send is on somebody's phone. I mean, that alone should be enough for you to get the phone the hell out of your bedroom. And if you've got a kid who's got one in their bedroom, get it the hell out of their bedroom too. That's really scary. Anyway, so why is the cell phone bad? I don't think we really need to get into it too much because it's pretty obvious. Number one, there's a light. And listen, I, the light coming from the cell phone into your eye is absolutely something that we see studies that show a decrement in terms of sleep quality, sleep onset latency, arousal. So, but it's a small light. There's other lights that can cause that too. But that is definitely part of the problem with the cell phone. The second is, that light can start to, to, to affect circadian timing. So when you look at a lot of these studies, what you're probably seeing is the light and the arousal from the communication or the game where you're trying to take a test tube full of liquid of purple and pour it into the purple and this one and get all the tubes the same color. And if you do, you win and it's great. Or what is the guy? There's a, what is the, there's an ad that I, anytime I'm on my cell phone and an ad pops up, it is for this game that I, I wish I could, I would love to end it. It's some king. It's like a king sitting there and there's about a, a fire is being get ready to engulf him or some, you know, water is going to drown him and you got to do something to save the king. I, I don't care about this king. Like you can play that. All I, I all that ad does is inspire anger 
to me. But you know, but 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 you see, I'm getting worked up now thinking about this ad. So I'm on there looking at New York Times and this ad is popping up or whatever like that. That's upsetting. And then you turn your phone off after you've read your articles in the New York Times. I mean, it could be a, a, a noble pursuit that you have with your phone, but you're still getting worked up one way or the other about it. And then I think the last thing is just that it's content. So it's light, it's circadian disruption, and it's the content that we're doing. And, and you've got your kids and I mean, what are they doing waking up in the morning, in the middle of the night, and they're on their phone with other people? You know exactly what they're doing. It's what you would have done when you were a teenager. And it's not conducive to great sleep. So how do we intervene? Well, the intervention is always, we've got to get the phones out of the bedroom. It's tough. It's hard to get phones away from kids. I think it's a little bit of an easier thing to get it out of the bedroom. You know, kids always make this argument. I need my phone for my schoolwork. Or if you take my phone away, I'm disconnected with all my friends. Okay, but now it's 11 o'clock. You should be disconnected from your friends. Like you can talk to your friends. I just, you just need to do it during the time when you all should be awake, not when you should be asleep. So there's two studies I just want to mention very quickly about what happens when you take it away. So there's a 2020 study called Effective Restricting Bedtime Mobile Phone Use on Sleep, Arousal, Mood, and Working Memory, a Randomized Pilot Trial. There were 19 individuals in the control, 19 in the experimental arm. So the 19 that had their phone just have it do whatever they wanted to, the 19 in the experimental arm basically were told 30 minutes before they go to bed, no phone. And so after four weeks, they looked at the numbers. And this these numbers, I think, are very representative of what you can expect if you can wrestle the phone out of your partner's hand, your child's hand, your own hand. And that was at baseline, these individuals were using their phone 5.5 hours per day, 1.5 hours in the time immediately before bed. That's a big percentage of the time. And when you, re- when you took it away after four weeks, sleep latency dropped from 31 minutes. So it took them 31 minutes to fall asleep before they entered the study. After four weeks of not having their phone 30 minutes before they go to bed, their latency dropped to 18 minutes. That's a big That's a big drop, right? I mean, that's 12 to 13 minutes faster. Again, hey, Chris, it takes me four hours to fall asleep. Should I get rid of my phone? The answer is always yes. But I don't know that if you're going to go from four-hour sleep latency to 18 minutes, but maybe you go to three and a half or something like that. So, I mean, again, it's all about what are the... 10 things we can do that make things 5% better, there's a 50% improvement right there. Um, Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index scores were looked at. So obviously the BSQI is is used in a lot of studies. It it went from a 10, which is pretty poor, to a 5.6 versus the control group started at 9.6 and moved to 8.5. There was also reduction in their pre-sleep arousal. The last study I want to talk about, because there's a line in it that I think is just a fantastic way to to end the podcast. Not as good as the limerick, which uh, somebody mentioned really liking the limericks from our Exploding Head podcast episode. Appreciate that. But this is pretty good in of itself. So this was a study in 2019 called Altering Adolescence Pre-Bedtime Phone Use to Achieve Better Sleep Health. Lovely title. So basically in this study, for one week... An hour before bed, individuals were not allowed to have their phone. So after one week, they looked at the results and the results were the individuals, the adolescents who were not using their phone for an hour before they went to bed. So now not 30 minutes, an hour, were sleeping an additional 21 minutes per night. I think that's really big. 21 minutes multiplied again by five school days per week. It's a hundred minutes, hundred minutes this week, hundred minutes next week, hundred. So look at it. The, look at it the opposite way that you're taking away sleep night after night from your kid. So you know this is the kind of message we're always putting into our athletes' ears: is that somebody you can gain twenty-one extra minutes of sleep over your competition by doing this. Put your phone away an hour before you go to bed. Is it going to make you score 50 points tomorrow? No, but think about over the grind of a season. Every night you're getting an additional 21 minutes of sleep versus your opponent. That matters. 
it's going to matter. These are like sixth and seventh graders we're talking about, eighth graders, ninth graders. So it's 21 minutes of sleep every night for their seventh grade year, their eighth grade year, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th. If you don't think that's going to have a meaningful impact on their academics, the college they eventually go to, their mental health, their physical health, you're out of your mind. So if you don't like what I'm saying and you don't like to hear me talk about John Mellencamp, you can listen to another podcast. Uh, but that's that's pretty much what it is. But I want to read you a line from this study that I think is incredibly telling. And the line is this, quote, participant recruitment was low, 26%, indicating many adolescents lack motivation to negotiate changes to their evening phone use. So the, the researchers are essentially acknowledging this was a tough study because we couldn't get young people to agree to give up their phone for one hour before they go to bed and after they go to bed for one week. I'm going to give another shout out to somebody really quick before we end this podcast and, and, um, one of my favorite people in sleep, and I got a bunch of them, uh, Roxanne Pritchard. She's up in Minnesota. I'm God, oh, Roxanne. I'm so sorry. She's at Saint Somebody's College. God, it's like Saint Joseph, Saint Olive, Saint. It's one of those, one of those, one of those northern saints up in uh, uh, Minnesota. I'm so sorry. Just look up Roxanne Pritchard, and you can see where she's at. Well, Roxanne does all kinds of amazing things with the students at this college, the athletes at the college. And she just is a master at making sleep engaging and fun and exciting for the students at her college. I mean, just does it like no other. And I remember talking to her about a challenge that she put out there for the students at her school where she said, look, I want you to get eight hours of sleep for one week. And if they did that, they got a shirt that had an eight on it. And everybody at the school wanted the shirt. So it became this thing where everybody wanted the shirt. Everybody was doing the eight hours. It was cool to do it. Everybody wanted to do it. And that's how we have to be with the phone. So I think Roxanne needs to get, instead of the shirt with the eight, the shirt with the little phone with the Ghostbusters red line with the mark through it. And if you can go a week at the college without your phone, an hour before you go to bed and after you go to bed. So no phone from the hour before you go to bed until you wake up the next morning, you get a t-shirt with the phone with a line through it. And my guess is it'd be super popular. Maybe we should do a thing like that on this show. Maybe we'll pick a week and all the listeners of the show, we're going to make a pact about, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. So listen, this podcast is coming out. I'm going to challenge everybody for the week starting today, Monday, or you're probably listening to this on Monday. So for the week starting today, I want you to just do an experiment where you give up your phone, you turn your phone off and you put it away somewhere in the kitchen an hour before you go to bed and you do not access it until after your alarm clock goes off. And then when the week's over, I want you to send me a text, a voice message, a video, whatever you want. DR Chris Winter Twitter, DR Chris Winter Instagram, TikTok, whatever. You can tell me to take your name off if you don't want your name out there. But I want to know what you think. And if, if you think, well, I didn't see anything. It was, it was a bust. I felt no different whatsoever after a week. Tell me about it. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to promise you that starting tonight, um, I'm going to put the cell phone away in my office an hour before I go to bed. I'll just tell you personally, I don't generally have the phone in my bedroom. So I'm going to continue to do that, but I'm going to make sure that an hour before I go to bed, it is plugged up and not accessed. And then I will not touch it until I wake up in the morning and I'm going to let you know how it goes. I want you to do the same. So that's it. Sleep and cell phones done and dusted. If you want to get in touch with the show, DR Swinner, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Blue Sky, Blue Sky Threads, whatever, uh, YouTube page. You can find us, our Spotify playlist, Hit us up. You, my books are The Sleep Solution, Why Your Sleep's Broken, How to Fix It, as well as The Rested Child. We definitely talk about phone use and The Rested Child. That's it for cell phone use and sleep. Communicate with me, but don't do it within an hour before you go to bed. Sleep well. <laughs>